Welcome to a special episode of The Buck Stops here with myself, Kirk Buckner, and I have got a special guest. I'm very excited about this because it's very few times that I feel like I sort of fanboy out, but I'm doing that here with my guest, Greg Oliver. I have been a fan of your work for probably 25 years. I think yours is the first website or wrestling website I probably ever came across uh, with Slam Wrestling. Wow, you make me feel old. Thanks. Um, I we do get that a lot now. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't maybe know the history, but then on the opposite side, we have the people that have been following the site forever. I mean, yeah. we started in nineteen late 1996, and we've been going ever since. There was a little tiny break in there where there wasn't much content being updated, but uh, we had a really great platform at the beginning uh, as a partnership with the the Sun newspapers. Um, now we're on our own, but we still are doing the same great content. Yeah. Uh, one thing, though, too, that as we were sort of talking a little bit a few months ago when we first talked about a project that I did, uh, you were kind enough to sort of share with me some of the other stuff that you'd, uh, that you'd done that I wasn't all that familiar with. So uh, ahead of time, guys, if you're really big into pro wrestling, I'm going to veer a little bit away from that because there's so much that Greg has done that I'm so fascinated with, especially uh, the book that you did on Billy Van. Uh for those not aware of who Billy Van is, he is, I would say, like a an icon of the Hamilton and Toronto area, was part of a show that a lot of us grew up with called the Hilarious House of Frightenstein that ran on CHCH uh, in the early 70s, but it kept running forever. So you didn't, so I would say like, it's safe to say like almost like two generations grew up with that show because they recorded so many. Well, yeah, yes, but it's still available on Tubi. It's available mm-hmm. on Crave. Like, so it's out there. Hilarious House of Frightenstein. It's worth it. They've they've had to edit it a little bit uh, to deal with some more decent copyright issues that are popped up over the years. But uh, that has oh. to do with music licensing and yeah, things okay. like that that have changed through the years and the rules have changed. But yeah, no, I, I I've always been a writer, Kirk, and that's sort of the important thing is that uh, I. I latched onto this Billy Van project, uh, I guess, 14 or so years ago now through a friend of mine, Stacy Case, that I worked on the book with. And we started down the road then, and it took a little while. You set things aside. Real life happens. Uh, there's all the wrestling things that I've done. But yeah, he's, uh, we we think of him as so Canadian, and yet he was on Sonny and Cher. He did these really big U.S. shows that, you know, he's known to a lot more people but maybe it says, oh, yeah, that guy, I recognize him, mm-hmm. as opposed to, well, even his work on Frightenstein, he's under his costume. Uh, but that show was syndicated in a lot of spots. The other one that got a lot of traction was called Party Game, also taped in Hamilton. Uh, it was a syndicated show, uh, charades, essentially. And mm-hmm. a lot of people still remember that quite fondly. He was a, an amazing actor, for sure, a comedian, could dance, could sing. He did, He could do all of it. What did it first attracted you to that project? I think on some level, I, I just didn't know much about Billy Van. And mm-hmm. yet he was this guy that I'd watched regularly on Party Game and, and Hilarious How to Frightenstein. The idea that this guy played all those different characters on the show, uh, it was just, it was intriguing. Uh, and, and then there was Bizarre is the other thing. that that That's a show that a lot of people in the U.S. would remember. It was on Showtime. I uh, had the topless girls. So that one stood out a little bit with, with <laughs> John Minor. Yeah, yeah, I remember. We actually filmed most of those skits twice because one of them would have the girls with their tops on. Um, but Billy Van was a part of that too. So all those things sort of came together. And one of the first interviews I did on the Billy Van project was actually talking to John Biner. And so that's, I you talk about fanboying, right? That That happens in my life too. I mean, you have to be professional as a writer, but you know, you're really excited to talk to somebody like, uh john biner or whether it's daryl sittler who was my captain my captain growing up uh or whether it's like you know pam from strange brew like you get to talk to these people (laughs) over the years and it's really cool um to do it yeah you need a professionalism but it's also you know inside you're you're jumping up and down excited now you also do a lot of projects uh with the history of hockey uh toronto maple leafs too that that i've noticed i'll forgive you for that i'm not a leaf fan even though i grew up in that area but actually i shouldn't say that it's not so much the team i hate just every time there's a big win you're planning a parade 
Yeah, it's it's an interesting world living here in Toronto. And I was uh, working at the Toronto Sun back in 92, 93, when they made the semifinals. And what a big deal that would have been. Because if you look back, you know, the Argos were so popular back then because we had, you know, he Rocket Ismail. And, mm -hmm. and then you had the Jays winning the World Series. It, it really was the center of the sports universe. And if the Leafs had somehow not been cheated out of it with the Gretzky uh, high stick, uh, you know, there would have been... <laughs> Canada final there, right? The the Habs and the Leafs. But yeah, no, I've written a lot about hockey. I grew up watching a ton of hockey. Uh, it, it just sort of came naturally. The first hockey book I did was called Don't Call Me Goon. So when you write up so much about wrestling and then you talk about fighting, it was sort of a natural little progression. And then you get in the loop and you get to know more people. And uh, yeah, it's been a fascinating trip for sure, writing about hockey as well. Now, one of the books that you just mentioned, uh, Don't Call Me Goon, uh, that's about uh, which enforcer? Oh, it's about a bunch of enforcers. It was more like it was more like the spirit of it, right? You talk to the, you talk to different guys, whether it was uh, a Larry Playfair, who's one of those big, tough guys in the blue line, as opposed to, you know, your, your Tony Twists or your, uh, like Brian McGratton was a popular goon at the time that I got to talk to. So you, you, you want to sort of deal with a little bit of the brotherhood, right? Mm -hmm. how they learned how to do it, how they got better at it. So it was a whole bunch of different little profiles, um, some anecdotes, and, and definitely about the, the nature of fighting. And the one that followed that was called the Goaltenders Union, which was in the same vein in the sense that, you know, the goalies are a union. They all sort of look out for each other. They're, it's a brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, where yeah, they're, brotherhood. Yeah, where, where they're, you don't hear a lot about the women fighting. Uh, yeah. But certainly the, the women goaltenders, we talked to some of them as well because it is it's like this weird fraternity of people that are in that and they they live a life that nobody else does and and again that goes a lot back to professional wrestling and and the oddity of, of the life that they lead uh you know trying to get out there just on occasion and and showcase themselves in their underwear for you know 20 people or twenty thousand people it's, it's a ridiculous industry now recently you got uh, some national attention for a story that you broke uh, with uh, Dwayne Johnson's uh, brothers that or brother or brothers and sisters that apparently didn't know that he had. Uh, that's a little bit misleading. He definitely knew about them in the last couple. Of years. Okay, but yeah, so certainly around the time when Rocky Johnson died, so mm -hmm. the Rock's father, they knew they they knew about most of those kids uh, except for one, which only came out after Rocky died. Okay, uh, but there's. Right. I broke a story in, in Sports Illustrated uh, online that talked about all these kids of Rocky Johnson that never grew up with him as a father. He basically had ne next to nothing to do with any of them, never sent any money, never supported the the, the mom. Uh, he may have talked to one of them or two of them a couple of times, but not much. So it's kind of a it could have been a real sad story. But instead, what happened is they've created their own little family. Mm -hmm. Right. All five of them found each other. Uh, the last surviving brother of Rocky Johnson is is Ricky Johnson, whose real name is Jay Bowles, and he lives in Toronto. And he sort of became the central figure in their lives, mm -hmm. and and his wife Jeannie. So it, it it became a really neat story. It's it's unfortunate the Rock has decided not to become a, a part of their lives. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you're one of the most famous people on the planet, you're naturally a little cautious, I think, and a little bit. Oh, of yeah, exactly. Worried about people trying to take advantage of you, but there's no doubting the legitimacy. The number of times we went over the um, DNA testing and made sure everything lined up was was really ridiculous. And working with the top notch people at Sports Illustrated was was eye opening, even for a guy like me who's been in the business writing for you know 35 years. It was it was really unique to learn and and work on a project like that. I think a lot, of, and you, you've had a, a history with Rocky Johnson yourself, because uh, I know you were trying to work on the first book with him, and it, there were a few things that sort of fell through. I I, and that, that's natural. I mean, it, yeah. it sounds like it's it's um, a, a bitter story, maybe in some, but the mm -hmm. fact is there's been lots of people I've had discussions with about doing books, and they just never come yeah. about. It's just when we're doing this Rocky Johnson project and, and doing the Sports Illustrated thing, you, you really do want to have... Mm -hmm it out there right and and not like somebody can come back to you later well you're you're all bitter because you didn't do the book with him it's like no it's it's just sort of the natural part of publishing right you talk to a lot of people it's got to be a right fit i mean pat patterson's book went through two or three different writers before he settled oh, on okay. Bertrand Hebert. And, and those things just happen and 
And that's fine. Christine Sinclair, I just got her book, this big famous soccer player. Well, oh. she started down the road with Jim Taylor on it, the mm -hmm. famous uh, writer out from BC. And I know that because Jim told me that he was all excited, but it ended up being written with Stephen Brunt. So I'm I'm hardly the only one where I didn't end up with the project. Yeah, but, but I think I, where I wanted to go with that is because the story of Rocky Johnson has been sort of painted a little bit differently over the last couple of years. And so when you see a show like Young Rock, I don't know if you've seen that. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, so it does well. I mean, there's certainly a piles upon piles of inaccuracies, and and what's otherwise kind of a fun show to watch, sort of hard to watch as a wrestling fan though, because I know that the Iron Sheep was not hanging out with Andre in Hawaii, but oh well. It's 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 a fun show. It's a network show. It's meant to be colorful, and there's a lot of historical inaccuracies, but you sort of just shake your head. Um, but they at least they didn't make Rocky Johnson a saint. Um, that's probably the most important thing. They certainly haven't gotten as dark as they could uh, with his um, checkered history, to say right. the least. Right. Um, and, and that's fine. And, and they haven't really explored much else either, right? There's been no mention of the siblings that he has acknowledged that live in Toronto from Rocky's first marriage. In fact, there's no mention at all of Rocky's first marriage, right? Ada was younger than him and, and he you know, courted and wooed her and then married her, but he still had two kids back in Toronto. But to be so, fair on that show, if that's from, if that's Rocky's story or Rock's story. It is, it is. He's going to focus on his mom. Right, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, when we get to the point where he marries Danny Garcia and he invites his, you know, half siblings to the, you know, is that going to be in there? I don't know, when they come to the wedding? I, the, exactly, you, you just live with it. It's it's entertainment, right? And then, and for that matter, that's what wrestling is. That's what hockey is. That's what all these things are. Even writing, like you want to be entertained, you want a little break, you want to learn something. Even these podcasts and vlogs and all that stuff. Now, your fandom. Uh, what was the first? Do you remember the first show that you saw? And was that at Maple Leaf Gardens? No, I actually grew up in Kitchener, which is about an hour from Toronto, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, maybe my first live no my first live show probably would have been some smaller indie show or wwf coming to town um which they would do fairly regularly back then i uh, i went to maple leaf gardens a handful of times over the years i mean it, it's an excursion right you're right. under age i i got bitten by hulkamania run over by hulkamania back in 85 86 kind of thing uh so you got quite into it but yeah at that point i'm still only 14 15 not quite able to go off on my own to toronto uh, that changed over the next couple of years and so i could go to indie shows in hamilton or whatever it may be um yeah it's it, an interesting journey that way i do wish i could go back in time and i think about all the things i missed i never went to a bear man mckigney show for example um whereas my brother did uh so you know, it, like I said, if you could go back in time, you, you not only had all this knowledge and ask all these guys stuff that you wish you could have, um, but yeah, you'd get to see some really great shows. So same with hockey. So you grew up a Leaf fan, I guess, uh, Kitchener Rangers. Absolutely. Went to tons of Kitchener Ranger games. Uh, probably went to uh, at least one Leaf game a year, uh, if not a couple. Uh, certainly went to, you know, Blue Jays and Argos games back in the day. Uh, we were big basketball fans before there was uh, much up here before the Raptors but we went to a lot of those NBA exhibition games that were up here where there was a cops Coliseum in Hamilton or Toronto uh, my brother's a very high-end basketball coach he coached at Queens University and then at Windsor University but now he runs something called basketballimmersion.com and he coaches coaches around the world he just got back from Australia uh, there was one year with the uh, NBA playoffs that he worked with three of the different teams that were in the semifinals so this this whole sports thing runs really deep in our family. That's kind of where I was going to go with that, because uh, there's also the other book that you did in baseball about uh, John Gibbons, uh, former manager of the Blue Jays. And I, I don't want to forget to mention all of this you can find on oliverbooks.ca. I got that right. You did. Yeah. Oliverbooks.ca. Uh, yeah. so the John. But I mean, you never know. And this is hard to explain to people sometimes, but life is about contacts and writing isn't any different. And it's not. It's, where's that next job going to come from? Sometimes you don't know. You meet a guy like John Arezzi, who was yeah. told to find me at the Call of Reality Club. And it turns out he was this interesting cat that had worked in baseball. He had done all kinds of wrestling stuff, both as a teen and then as an adult, as a promoter. And then he worked in country music for 20 years. Oh, 
Oh. And so he did all these interesting things. And so I worked with him on his memoir. And that was fascinating because you got to learn all kinds of different stuff, right? The country music stuff, for example. I, I'm not a huge country music fan growing up, but I became one. In fact, I just got Kelsey Ballerini's new CD today. And it was John who discovered her and, and took her into the, you know, the the publishing world and get her out there and get her recorded. Um, but it was John Gibbons who knew John Arezzi. And so at some point, uh, John Arezzi made an introduction. John Gibbons wrote one of the forwards for Arezzi's book. And I remember joking with Arezzi, it's like, hey, I should do Gibbons books next. And sure enough, that's, it's not what happened next, but it's what happened down the road. Uh, it, and John Arezzi was my introduction to Medusa Michelli too, who uh, I did her book, which is coming out in the spring too, called uh, The Woman Who Would Be King. And for those not familiar with her, she was a pro wrestler for like 17, 18 years. But then she went into monster trucks and became an even bigger name. And she won two world championships in the world of monster trucks and monster jam. Uh, she's a fascinating person. Um, and that was a crazy book to work on. And doing that at the same time as a John Gibbons book was not something I'd recommend to anybody. But now that they're both about to go to the printer, I can sort of take a deep breath and and work on something else. Uh, I was talking to a mutual friend, uh, Kenny Casanova. Yeah. Because he, he worked on the ODB book. Uh, do you find it hard to do that? Because like when I worked on the book for for the late uh, Chavo Guerrero, I found it hard to try to make it from his voice because I, I felt like I wasn't always capturing it. Is it do you, did you find it harder to try and do that from a female point of view or not really? Uh, yes and no. I was certainly very cognizant of that and and a little bit worried. But in the end, you just sort of let Medusa Deb tell her own story and i just tried to get out of the way um if anything i took out expletives like you know it would have been uh yeah, i did the same <laughs> one one big yeah and there's still a lot in there uh whereas like gibby he swore a little bit as we did the interviews but you know in the end we took out most of them because he's like well my mom's gonna read this book so everybody's a little bit different it is a challenge sometimes finding that right voice, but you got to have confidence in yourself and in your ability and you, you do your best. Uh, yeah. I don't know how else to describe it. It's, it's not like something you can really be taught. You only get better at it with practice. And that's my fourth. So that's four different autobiographies. Now that I've worked on the first one was Gilles Graton was a goalie. It was Gratuni the loony. And he had such an interesting perspective on things anyway, that maybe I, went in easy if that makes any sense because he was such a unique individual that gave up hockey to go into transcendental meditation and yoga that you know he was a unique guy right from the start uh what's the next project good Thank question you. Oh, okay i don't have anything actually signed uh i or more importantly something that's immediately going to generate revenue mm -hmm. i've got a couple of different projects i'm working on and um Something may come to fruition, something may not. Uh, there's always a thousand things to do, whether it's slam wrestling stuff, whether it's um, even just personal stuff. It's nice to take a little break. Um, I work with uh, the sport gallery and the old sport magazine here and there, too. So there's always something out there to do. And I, I like that variety. I've been fortunate. My wife, Meredith Renwick, has been very supportive and um I, I got to be the stay-at-home dad, which is the best job of all. And our son's now 16 and doesn't really need us at all. But, you know, he, we got him to that stage. And that's uh, been a wonderful ride all of its own. And when I look at my list of books and things that I did while he was little, it's like, how did I pull this off? I don't know. Well, I want to close with something that I, just to gauge your reaction on. I'm doing a, a show tomorrow. Uh, one of my regular shows, I'm just doing a bit of self-promotion here. Uh, it's called uh, This Crap Was on National Television. And as I was doing the research, your name came up. Uh-oh. No, no, I, I, think you'll, I think you'll get a kick out of it. So it's I, I do it with somebody I think you've interviewed also, uh, Chris Bournet, who did <sighs> Dirty Wrestler. Yep. yep. So Chris and I, we do that show. And because uh, we, we first met because of our mutual, our mutual projects. And so he interviewed me, I interviewed him. Uh, we found that we had a rapport. And so I just keep throwing him bad TV to watch, and then we review it. So we're doing Learning the Ropes, the pilot. Yeah, 
Yeah, I got actually got to go to a taping of that. So that's loud. That's what I read. Yeah. Um, he's it was an interesting attempt at a show. And we look at Young Rock now and how much money he's been spent on that. And learning the ropes is sort of the opposite. It was a uh very cheaply made Canadian sitcom that tried to get some traction in the US. And and for the longest time, that was certainly the case in general with Canadian sitcoms, right? They always looked so weeny compared to what we saw in the US. And and there was always that. I don't think that's quite the case anymore, just partly because the technology helps too, right? Mm -hmm. When your your ability to do the digital filming, you know, your iPhone can be just as good as a big camera. Uh, I think there's not not the same barriers to making the great products that there used to be. Um, but yeah, learning the ropes, Lyle Ozato. Uh, there's some neat little people that were on it. Uh, Yannick Bisson, who became a much bigger star and is still doing CBC things. Uh, yeah, no, it was fun. And and they'd bring in the, the NWA wrestlers who really hadn't done much up in Toronto at all because we, at the time, CKCO was only just starting to air one of the NWA programs and it was not on a very good time slot. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of, yeah. but not a lot of, good wrestling up there we were stuck with wwf for the longest time and that was only the early days uh and and i again i wish i could go back in time because i would have loved to sit down with lyle Lozado and talk football uh, i'm a big football fan and 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 he had this you know learning the ropes he was really learning about all the pro wrestling stuff and of course he was one of the first guys involved with all the steroids and coming out you know acknowledging it all so it's unfortunate he's gone and not able to tell those stories. But yeah, you guys will have a blast uh, riffing on uh, learning the ropes. We well, yes, uh, I, I have a, there's a lot of unintentional humor and well, God bless Lyle, he tried hard. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody's going to say he's going to win an Oscar, but that was part of the idea of the role, right? Was that he's supposed to be this this teacher by day and this uh, wrestler by night, and it it, it sort of works. It sort of works. But just not very great. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, I can't say that there are worse actors on it than Lyle. Yeah, well, again, it's Canadian <laughs> TV, right? We're not paying for the best. And yet we go back to Billy Van and and man, he was awesome in everything he did. He, he threw his heart into it. He never really phoned it in. He did all kinds of educational stuff that's, uh, you know, whether it's bits and bites or um, he did that's this. That's right. Yeah. You know, with Luke, Luke that. Goy. Yeah, so he did all that. He did. There's this these uh, science, these physics cartoons that used to be shown in high school, right? On called Eureka, and he did all the voices for those. I remember that. I remember yeah. that. Okay. So there's all these neat little things that he did that he just he said work was work to him, but he always did his best with it, as opposed to his personal life, which was a bit of a mess. And that's that can be with any of these books. That can be the more challenging part, right? Is is dealing with that because you can, i don't want to ever ignore that in a story right i think it needs to be there that you know if you were married we need to acknowledge that person and not just completely write them out of the story we don't have to write a lot about them if there was acrimony or whatever happened but i if you're telling your story it's got to be the whole story and that's generally what i tell my subjects and it's usually worked i've had to fight a few times but uh mm -hmm. that's the nature of the beast i guess Okay. Well, again, you can find all of Greg's works on all oliverbooks.ca, uh, uh, slamwrestling.ca, which is oh, slam, slamwrestling.net. Yeah. I'm sorry, slamwrestling.net, uh, slamwrestling.net, and it's. Uh, I don't think you can tell Toronto pop culture story without Greg Oliver. Oh, well, I don't know. That's a big deal, but I appreciate that, and certainly the. I don't think there's too many people who have done more for the Canadian wrestling scene over the years and and preserving its history than myself but that you know i appreciate you saying that but there's also people that help you right that help each other and that's you know like advance nevada or or the the guys in quebec i mentioned bertrand bear and pat prod or whoever it is right you all work together and and do the best you can and of course i always i always tell kenny casanova i have to put him up put him over like an mf every time <laughs> so Ken, Kenny's a good self promoter. He's obvious. It's obvious that he was a wrestling manager at one point out there, uh, hyping himself. Still is, I think. Yeah. Here and exactly. there. Well, thank you so much, Ed. It was an honor to have you on the show. Thanks for having me on, Kurt. Thank you.